and Vanessa Hua is an award-winning, best-selling author and columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. For two decades, she has been writing about Asian Asia and the diaspora, filling stories, filing stories from China, Burma, Panama, South Korea, and Ecuador. She works and teaches at the Warren Wilson MFA program and the Writers Grotto. Caroline Kim was born in Busan, South Korea, but moved to America at an early age. She's lived on the East Coast, Midwest, and Texas, but now makes her home in Northern California with her family. Her poetry and fiction has appeared in several publications, including The Rumpus, The Michigan Quarterly, and Cosmonauts Avenue. Her collection of short stories, The Prince of Mournful Thoughts, and other stories has won the 2020 Drew Hines Literature Prize. Please join me in welcoming Caroline Kim and Vanessa Hua. Thanks so much, Erica, for that lovely introduction. Caroline, I'm so excited to be reading with you tonight in, in a conversation. You do. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to read just something short from the reissue of Deceit and Other Possibilities, uh, an amuse-bouche, an appetizer to Caroline's reading. Um, but this was, uh, I'll, I'll read from, let's see. Um, a short story called Accepted, uh, which I got the idea for the story uh, back in 2007, or I, I first got an inkling of it when I heard about um, a Korean American woman who, who made her way to Stanford. Anyway, I'll read the excerpt and, you know, hopefully we can chat about it later tonight. But um, again, I'm reading from Accepted, from Deceit and Other Possibilities. It occurred to me that I'd become too comfortable with breaking and entering. Back from field training, I'd leapt onto the windowsill in a single bound, no awkward scrambling, as though onto a pommel horse. I tiptoed in the dark until realizing my roommates were out. Too tired to shower, I collapsed onto the futon and fired up Julia's laptop to fill the void with light and noise. We met fall quarter after I studied her for a half hour while she sunbathed. Julia seemed like the kind of girl who adopted wounded birds and stray puppies, willing to help a newcomer in need. I told her I had nowhere to stay because of a mix-up in housing. Officials said they might be able to find something within a week or two, but until then, I'd be sleeping in the 24-hour room at the library. What a way to start freshman year. Julia, a sophomore, invited me to crash in the room she shared with her best friend. One night turned into a week, another and another, and then we were at the end of the quarter, dead week, finals, and saying our goodbyes for the holidays. Without their knowledge, my roommates had aided and abetted me. My classmates considered me no different than them, these student body presidents, valedictorians, salutatorians, national merit scholars, model UN reps, academic decathletes, all state swimmers and wrestlers, and other shining exemplars of America's youth. The rejection from admissions was a mistake. That's what I told myself after I clicked on the link and logged onto the portal last spring. Stanford had denied another Lane Park, another in Irvine who'd also applied. I waited for a phone call of apology along with an email with the correct link. I hadn't meant to lie, not at first, but when Jack Min donned his Stanford sweatshirt after receiving his acceptance, I yanked my cardinal red hoodie out of my locker. Another week passed and I posed with Jack for the school paper, a banner year for the church our families both attended and for Sparta High with two students in a single class admitted to Stanford. When I showed my parents the article as proof of my acceptance, Appa held the newspaper with his fingertips as if a bridal lace he was preserving on special order. He reeked of chemicals from the cleaners, the stink of exhaustion and servility. Assiduous, he said, his praise for my hard work. My vocab drills, which began nightly when I was in kindergarten, had fallen to him. For years, he'd been reading the dictionary for self-improvement, and the words we'd studied together coded what otherwise might remain unsaid. Sagacity, I said. I was thanking my father for his wisdom. In June, with graduation approaching, I politely alerted admissions of its error. You haven't received any notification, the woman asked. A rejection, I said, for another Elaine Park. Only then did I realize how ridiculous I sounded. Could I appeal the decision or get on the wait list, I asked. No, she gently said. She explained that Joe, those chosen off the wait list had been notified two weeks ago and wished me the best of luck. All those hours, 
all that money, the after school academic cram programs whose costs kept us from moving out of our tiny two bedroom apartment, other sacrifices, Appa putting off visiting the doctor until his colds turned into bronchitis and then pneumonia. Uma's eyes went bad, squinting at the alterations she did for extra cash at the dry cleaners where they both worked. Stanford was the only school to which I'd applied, the only school my parents imagined me attending. I was supposed to become a doctor and buy my parents a sedan and a house in a gated community. A doctor had a title, respect, it would never be brushed off like them, never berated by customers and never stubbed by sales clerks. When I asked the admissions officer if I could send additional letters of rec, her tone turned icy. We never reverse a decision officially rendered, she said and hung up. The problem I came to understand was that my story was too typical. My scores, my accomplishments, and my volunteer work were identical to hundreds, maybe thousands of other applicants, and admissions had reached its quota of hard luck, hardworking children of immigrants. I'd been too honest, straightforward where I should have embellished, ordinary where I should have been fanciful. My classmate Jack, he'd launched his own startup sending used cell phones to Africa. If only I'd been a homeless teen or knit socks and mittens for orphans in China. If only I'd had cancer. So that's uh, it for now. Um, and I'm excited to hear Caroline Green for, from her wonderful new collection. I'm so glad you read from that story. That, I love that story. It, it related to it, it's really devastating. Okay. Um, but yeah, I came from the kind of family where for family vacations, we went to visit colleges, so. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think I'm just going to read a little bit from the first story, Mr. O. The doctors say he no can help me. He don't find any problem. He say, Mr. O, you might think perhaps about consulting another doctor, a psychiatrist. Many times such phantom aches and pains can be caused by stress or excessive worry. I can give you a referral if you'd like. No, I shake my head. I know what you're talking about. You don't believe this pain in my neck. Almost, I can no longer swallow. You think I'm crazy, have some kind of mental problem. What do you know anyway? Doctors, they're just supposed to find place where pain start and fix it. Two months ago this start, sudden pain and neck near back on left side. Like somebody take my skin between finger and pinch. Like my older brother used to. Like I do to younger brother. Hard to move with that kind of pain. That kind enough for making stay down. Last week, two days I not get up. I stay in bedroom, watch Korean videos. Usually feel good to hear Korean language. My ear understand right away. But with pain in neck, hard to enjoy. Korean sound like English, coming long way to me. It take time to travel, and in the meantime, this pinching. This is the third doctor I see, this one specialist. Always they say they can find nothing. Wife come with me, but she don't believe me either. She just trying to help me. On way home, when wife say, what do you say? I tell her he say I depress, go see psychiatrist. Wife look worry, then mad. She want to know where exactly pain is. I tried to explain, but car almost hit fence. So she say, watch the road, watch the road. I say, I watching the road fine, but she want me to show her pain or not. She say, you problem, you nervous all the time. Never relax. I say, she make me nervous asking question and then screaming when we far away from fence anyway. She just say, I nervous again. I yell to wife, she never support me. That why I nervous all the time. She only get quiet watch the road. I never nervous when I young. I don't care anything. Now worry too much. I almost 60. How many ahead? I think not many. Too bad. Too bad. I know it make no sense to look too much at history, but how else are we going to understand self? We are, how you say, sum of decision we make. That who we real are. How we act mean who we are. I studied Kierkegaard at Yonsei University in 1957. Long time ago, but coming back to me now. I remember he say, only understand life backward, but have to live forward. Okay, but sometime man come to place where not so much forward, but much, much past. What you do with everything remember, but now gone. Can't bring back, can't forget. 
I have a conversation with Mr. O'Brien last week. He owner of two Texaco stations. Every week he bring his dirty towel from the shop, he say. Mr. O, do Korean people drink as much as the Irish? Yeah, I say, even more. You people drink beer. Koreans drink soju. Stronger, I say, patting my stomach. That where it burn. Mr. O'Brien think for a minute, he say, somebody told me that the Koreans are the Irish of the Orient. You know what I think? I think Irish are Korean of Europe, but he too nice, so I say Korea more like Italy. I try to think of the word. I draw with my finger on counter. Peninsula, Mr. O'Brien say? Yeah, peninsula, peninsula. Can be attacked from many sides. Always have to be careful. That why they have mafia. Koreans and Italians emotional too. Eating and drinking important. Mr. O'Brien look like he don't know what I'm talking about, but he smile. Too bad, I'm talking about who I am. Then Mr. O'Brien say, hey yeah, Ireland is a peninsula too. He hit me on the arm. He say, yeah, that's true. After doctor appointment, we go to laundromat. Drive by suds and things, laundromat two block away. Parking lot empty. Our place have three cars. One belonged to Daisy, day lady worker. She may be 75, look like 65, act like 55. She never stopped talking. Strong too, lift laundry, help customer carry basket in, out, talk, smile all day. Two dryers not working. Always some kind of problem. The change machine break too many times and people don't close wash a door tight so it leak. Sometimes people put too many clothes inside, the door open by itself. Sometimes people so stupid. They don't understand if too many clothes, then no washing take place. No place for water and soap to go. Same with dryer. You fill it tight, it take years to dry. Many, many waters. No long-term thinking. First time I come here, I worry. How much can laundromat make? I asked Mr. Eberly, man who sold me place, how do you make enough to pay two ladies work there? Mr. Eberly say it a good neighborhood, low income white family. Blacks go to other laundromat, one where no one work. Man only come at night to take money and fill change machine. But here, this what I wonder. Why people who are able to own house, no matter how small, why they not buy own washer and dryer? Would they spend a one year at laundromat enough to buy very nice set? Kenmore, maybe even front loader. This what I think, problem is vision. People think only one day ahead, one month, one year too long to think about. I understand, but have to do anyway. Even don't know what's gonna happen next six months or year, still good to have some plan, still good to be working for future. Also, people who live around laundromat spend little bit of money every day, never have enough. Hard to them to imagine spend six, $700 at one time. Wife act like that too sometime. She remember time when money come in and go out before we even see. Hard to take breath or plan. Today, one leak. I turn machine off and push door closed tight. Wife already cleaning floor. Then dryers. I go behind dryers to see problem. Two small wires broken. Look like maybe a rat. Rat have sharp teeth. I feel pain again in my neck. It feel like burning, first flame, then cold. How can doctor be right? Has to be real. I can feel it. Then maybe everybody right? I crazy. Sometimes wife say so. She say, you crazy, you dreamer. When are we going on cruise? When we go to Europe? I say, not now. She don't understand I'm talking about future. Sometime only joy is drink and talk about future. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. I love that story. Um, I actually just texted the quote that to my a, a Korean American friend of mine that Irish are the Koreans of Europe. And he pointed out that there are many more Koreans than Irish people. So in fact, Koreans should be the point of reference. So maybe that's a Korean thing to say. <laughs> um, but uh, what I love about that story and um, so many in this collection, which is there's, you know, sort of equal parts humor and, and devastation and I was really interested in, um, I feel like you are kind of addressing things like trauma and what's unspoken, whether it's from um, the Korean War or, uh, you know, uh, assimilation or, you know, the struggles of immigration. And um, I'm just so interested in kind of 
if you said if that was you know something that you sense as a theme in your in, in these stories like how the ways in which they they manifest um and in the body or you know it, it, or or in other ways um yeah i don't know if it was a, a conscious thought but the historical trauma i definitely have thought about a lot because I never lived through the war, my, but my parents were pretty young during the Korean War. It's something that they never talk about and none of my relatives will ever talk about. But I've always felt it as a, a, like a real presence. You know, the war loomed there and it changed everything, you know. There was always, there's a, always a sense of before and after. Um, so yeah, I always felt like, wow. I mean, so when I heard later on, you know, when I was older, like how these historical traumas kind of pass themselves down to later generations that really resonated with me. And I thought like, wow, yeah, I've never lived through this war, but I feel like it's been a part of my life, you know, part of my whole life. Um, and then I started to kind of want to kind of become interested in, you know, more, um, more of Koreans, Koreans history. And, you know, I mean, I mean, it's true for every country really, but I mean, there's just so much trauma. Right. But you know, it was interesting. I, um, I, as a as a journalist, I I've done some reporting from Korea, and I interviewed mm -hmm. this um, soap opera director. He also did movies, but basically, he had a whole theory on uh, why Korean soap operas are so popular. But he's like, we have been because it, primarily because of Han. Like, uh -huh. we have been invaded so many times that we we really know suffering and can portray it in our pop culture. So or movies. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever thought about like how much Han really was discussed when you were growing up or if it's like a concept that you think <laughs> bears any uh, uh I actually, ha I mean, it's not anything I've ever talked about. I, I do feel like it's something that has, I've always felt. And I, I love that you said that about the <laughs> Korean director, because I've had the same thought. Um, I think there's something, I don't know, it, because of, you know, Korea's placement, where it's between these three kind of really big powers, it's always had to really struggle to survive. And um, so there's always been a lot of suffering and they kind of turned it into like this beautiful kind of suffering. And I know, and I love Korean soap operas too. And part of the reason I do that is because they're kind of like, they'll go skirt right up to that line of sentimentality because they're going for the big emotions. Yes. Yeah. And you know, they go like, and you watch them and they're always, almost always talk about not just like what's going on between the characters, but like what it means about life and what it says about people and humanity. And I like that it kind of always goes there. And I think Koreans do, I mean, even when I talk with my parents, it's a normal conversation, then they'll suddenly, they'll like start telling me like, this is the way life is, you know, they're like, they're trying to impart these things to me. <laughs> and I think it's because Korean culture, uh, it's almost been wiped out several times. And so <clears throat> Korean culture, I mean, within my house, it was like, oh, Korea is number one, you know? But then stepping outside of the house was like a completely different experience. Oh, right, what it, what it means to, to grow up as a Korean American. Yeah. Uh, so we, uh, we, this was in our chit chat before the, the program started a bit. So you were born in Busan, but you grew up on the East Coast. What, what parts or? Yeah, so we moved here when I was six, and we lived in Boston for, we were um, kind of my, my dad's sister sponsored us. Mm -hmm. So we lived with her for a couple of months, and then we moved pretty far out in Massachusetts. It was right near the New Hampshire border. And it was a largely, you know, a blue collar white town. And I mean, most of the people I encountered had never heard of Korea before. Right. So, or they're like, you must be Chinese. Oh yeah. China was like Chinese. And then they had a herd of Japanese people. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of like really crazy questions. Like, you know, do you have refrigerators in Korea? And right. Are there prostitutes? <laughs> I, don't know why those oh, I, I do remember I was on a summer program in Taiwan and uh, like we went, visited an army base and they were like, this is a banana <laughs> in the United States. So like people just maybe worldwide have no idea like how other people and other places live. It's such an interesting to have live like grow up like that. Such an interesting experience. Like so, nobody ever had ever heard of Korea except 
there would be this class of people, kind of older gentlemen, who had actually gone and fought in the Korean War. Right. I know you because I kill people who look like you. <laughs> Right, so you would have these strange, often strange interactions with people like that, you know, it was, it's a very weird experience. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, another time I remember going to a, a bed and breakfast and we're like walking to the dining room and there's like a plaque that says fought at Iwo Jima and <laughs> so then I <laughs> down and they're very pleasant and, and then they're like, my, she like tells me like, my husband thinks that you must be Japanese and I'm like, mm -hmm. I wonder why. <laughs> And then I explain, you know, I'm Chinese. And then as we're, you know, all very pleasant. And then as we're leaving, uh, she said, I, well, I hope you decide to stay. And I'm like, uh, I, from here. <laughs> so, but anyway, oh, they, yeah. were, they were very, uh, they were, they were older, old and kind. And yeah, the world, the world is changing. So. Well, did you grew up, I mean, you were born in the U.S. Yes, yes. So. And did your parents come here for school or they came yeah, as a They came here um, for graduate school in the Midwest and then um, made their way out to California in the 70s. And, um, but it was, it was a, you know, the suburb where I grew up was not so diverse. Um, but I mean, <laughs> at least you could always know that there was like a Chinatown, like down the way, like through the tunnel, like uh, accessible. Um, so I don't know. Um, so, so yeah, so, so there was that, but I mean, I do think, um, growing up as, uh, in an immigrant household does, did give me a certain amount of like, um, double consciousness, which I think, uh, I mean, who's to say, like, is that why I'm a writer or is that, I started thinking that way because I was a writer first, like it's very chicken egg, but I don't know if you've ever thought about whether this double consciousness you might've acquired as a, you know, immigrant has also shaped your writing or open the way to being a writer. Yeah, I do. I do uh, wonder about that. Uh, Cause I'm always wondering like, what if I had stayed in Korea? Like what, who would I be now? Like what kind of job would I have? Like, would I be married? I, I don't know. And I just remember uh, until I moved to America, cause I was like six. And maybe that's also a time when you start to kind of separate and think of yourself as your own person. So maybe it like coincided with that. I don't know, but yeah. I just remember uh, kind of when we moved to America, looking at myself from the outside for the first time. So seeing myself the way other people saw me. Um, and that was a very kind of strange experience <laughs> to have. And so I feel like that's a consciousness that I think writers have. And then also I think um, because I wasn't really sure how to negotiate this country and because my parents didn't really speak the language, they couldn't really help me. I felt like I had to become really like attuned to like what other people were, you know, how they were feeling, what they were like, you know, became kind of like a quick judge of people. And just really, um, I just feel like as an immigrant kid, you have to be super observant because oh, yeah. you're trying to learn the rules and what is the rules of this new place and what what are the hierarchies or like who do I need to be you know who's like might be a danger to me who could be an ally that kind of thing um so yeah I think that does that probably does create kind of like a writer's consciousness and I've noticed a lot of writers you know when I read their bios the immigrants uh, they were pretty young around the same age so I think that's something to that well, and I think, but then on the other hand, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, we we have our childhood heroes, you know, uh, you know, Laura Ingalls or Anne of Green Gables or whatever. And then there's the the books we read that are in the quote unquote canon. And so, um, the, the and then you know everything that's presented to us is sort of like, oh, to be a part of this is not to have it's not to have a face like yours or or like not to have like a story mm -hmm. yours to tell. To the point where I think. In college, I, you know, I'd been writing stories all my life, but um, in college, I was like, okay, I think I'm only going to write about white characters because I think that's what literature is. And I don't know if, um, and that lasted maybe about a year, but as I began to get exposed to other stories, sort of the broader range than, you know, what had been through K through 12 education. And I don't know if you had a similar experience or like what, how you always, how you, how you found a way to sort of center the Korean, Ameri Korean and Korean American experience in your work? You know, I don't not read, until I read The Woman Warrior in college, 
I'd never read a book that had an Asian person, like an Asian person's consciousness. Right. So um, I just didn't grow up thinking at all about being a writer at all. Like I, you know, I was like an avid reader and sometimes I would write, but it never seemed like, it just did not something that really crossed my mind at all until I read The Woman Warrior. Um, and it's, but, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people feel this way too, like kind of, you know, books save my life. And, you know, the law, and you imagine yourself, right, in those books. And it's very, that's what's wonderful about books. Like, no matter who you are, you can imagine yourself. It's such a great experience. It's only like, if something kind of pops up, I'm trying to think of, I don't know if it happens in a book, but you know, you know that movie Fargo? Uh, yes. I just, well, I remember the wood chipper. <laughs> I mean, I love that movie. So I was like super, super into it. But like three quarters of the way into it, there's this Korean guy. I don't know if you remember him, this Korean guy character. Like, I am so lonely, <laughs> right? Is that, is that what happened? I, had, I mean, I just... He gets on um, the, uh, Francis McDormand. Right? Yeah, like, like he a, was a friend of hers. Maybe they went to school. To, I don't remember exactly the thing, but he pops... He's a very weird character and... I don't even know what he has to do with the story at all. But that's the moment, like you're going along, yeah, yeah, I feel like, and then you're like, oh no, I'm that guy. Like, I'm not Francis McDormand, I'm that guy, you know? It just, those experiences, okay, first of all, we should just not have those kinds of experiences. But that, that really said something to me, you know, that. So, yeah, I mean, I think what I loved about your book, I saw your blurbs were from Alex Chi, from E.J. Ko, from Eugenia Kim, and um, it just seems like Asian American literature is much more expansive right now, or like, I don't know if you have thoughts on like where just this flowering, so to speak. I'm, I'm so excited because, so I recently had um, wrote a little kind of listicle thing about 10 con contemporary Korean American books. Mm -hmm. And when I started like really like kind of thinking about it, there were so many, I was really right. excited and it was really hard to kind of narrow it down. And then on Twitter, and this is why I love Twitter, I discover new Korean American writers all the time. And so I, it just feel, I feels to me like there are a lot of us writing and maybe they'll be, it, maybe it's getting better for all of us. I mean, I don't know, do you remember in the spring when all that stuff about what the publishing world really looks like behind the, behind the curtain came out? And it was, it was pretty sad and depressing. But I mean, it was good that it came out into the open. Yeah. And so now people could talk about it and do something about it. So um, God, that access is really important. And I know, I know we could use a lot more of it because I think there's this idea that, oh, all immigrant stories are the same. They all follow the same trajectory. But I mean, honestly, our stories are really different. Like we, if you grew up in Chinatown versus growing up in the Midwest in the middle of nowhere, that was a really different experiences. Right, the suburb, the suburban Chinese. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, I, I just feel like we haven't really even scratched the surface of that yet. So, so with your stories, um, I mean, they span like, uh, I mean, there's one said Imperial Korea, there's like, said, you know, it feels like in the 60s. I mean, it's all, you know, contemporary. And um, maybe could you talk about a bit, like, over what period of time you, you wrote the book and sort of, like, mm -hmm. how that shaped your... Th oh, you have the speculative fiction one is, as well. Like, so what, what kind of made you think, like, oh, this is a collection? Yeah. How do, how do these separate things become a thing? Um, I, I don't know. I just tried to... Um... I got really into studying Korean history because I felt like, I felt so Korean. And then I was like, what does it mean to feel so Korean? I don't even know Korean history. <laughs> and Wait, I don't really feel so Korean. Was this later or? No, all my life, like whatever, oh. some like, um, with some Korean feeling, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, partly from the food and partly from, you know, my family. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when I really start to break it down, I was like, how Korean really am I? Like, how Korean can I be if I don't really know my own history? Yeah. And I can't really, I don't speak Korean. Well, I may speak Korean like a six-year-old. And I've, 
tried you know, taking classes, but ugh, I'm just never going to get to the point where I could read like a history book or anything. Um, so then I thought, well, I mean, this is like, it's so possible to learn like 3000 years of history. <laughs> now. Yeah. So I just started to think about like, okay, if I were a Korean person living in Korea, what would I know? Just like, what are some stories that I would just know just from living in Korea? And one of them was the Prince Sado story. I think that's, that's kind of redone, worked a lot in like Korean soap operas and movies. And I'm sure there are stories and novels and hopefully one day, like I'll be able to read some of them, they'll be translated. Um, but I was like, God, I really wish I could read this story. And because I wasn't, I was like, well, then I guess like, maybe I'll just try to imagine it myself. <laughs> so it, it was like that. And then the Korean War story kind of came out of the same desire. It was like, oh, I really want to read some stories about the Korean War because I don't really, what, I mean, I just feel it. It feels like such a palpable presence in my life. But I don't know anything about it. Like, I don't know any details. Like, I would try to ask my parents, like, so, like, how did you, so my mom escaped from North Korea. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, she was probably like nine years old and she had three younger siblings and they had to kind of escape down this mountain in the middle of the night. It was just, to me, sounds like amazing and dramatic and like, tell me every detail. But she just does, she's like, oh, it's fine. And then I'm like, okay, then you got to Seoul and you lived in Seoul for a while. She's like, yeah, but then we had to escape because you know, Seoul was bombed so many times and we had to get on these, you know, packed trains. And again, it's like so dramatic and I just can't get any details. And she's like, it's fine. <laughs> you know, I think she was trying to protect me in some way. Yeah. Although I was recently uh, asking my mom and she's in her early eighties. I also realized it was a very long time ago because <laughs> I'm like, but what about this? And then what about that? And then it's like, I mean, she's she doesn't have dementia or anything. It's true, a really long time ago, and we especially live in a year that where everything feels like uh, yesterday feels like a year ago, right? So that is so true. This yeah, this year is completely messing me up. <laughs> so um, what? Uh, I mean, what, what what's it been like to debut, <laughs> or, or or what what plans do you have for? making the best of it or for, for later or? I don't know. I mean, I guess I, maybe there's a slight advantage in that. I don't know what's, what it's supposed to be like. <laughs> so yeah. this, this is all I know. Um, it's still been pretty exciting anyway. I mean, you know, I worked on this book. I started writing the, these first stories probably like 2001. So it's been like a 20 year journey and until probably two or three years ago, I never saw it as a book and didn't think about really getting it published. Um, so just seeing that it actually like kind of did come together is super exciting. Um, I feel, I think I read somewhere that more people are reading during the pandemic. I hope that's true. So <laughs> their independent bookstores, hopefully. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I, I, I definitely actually have been reading a lot more during this pandemic too. And I think we're just all kind of like taking in a lot of like art forms, like watching movies and, you know, binging on TV shows because that's kind of all we have right now. So um, yeah, I just, I don't know otherwise what it would be like. It seems okay. It's, it's, I do wish like, we could do these things live and I could like be sitting next to you, you know, face to face. With our, with our vi visor and our <laughs> lives. Right, right. But yeah, I was, I was thinking about how much I miss being, uh, doing events at bookstores and meeting audience members and also the joyousness of that celebration. I hope yep. you were able to go celebrate with your family and friends or ha yep. have you yet or... Um, have, oh yeah, definitely with my family. I have, yeah. It's been. Are, there, are your kids impressed? Not somewhat uh, impressed? Not impressed at all? No, if you want to impress teenagers, you really should publish a book. <laughs> oh, so they're finally impressed. Oh, they're super impressed. Oh, okay. Like, I, I, I didn't tell them I was a writer until about three years ago. You came clean. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I, and I don't have a study or a desk, so they didn't really see me like, you know, furiously working. I, used to just write on my bed so they were they thought I was just lazy so. <laughs> Get out of bed 
mom. So when I, it's so fun. I was like, okay, I'm going to like tell them a writer. I'm going to kind of like show them more of the process. They were like, what? Do you have a book? <laughs> What's their first question? But well, I don't know. I think my, my own kids are, they're nine. They're, one is moderately impressed or he'll be like, oh, if, if, you, if this means you have a book, it means you're famous. And I'm like, well, <laughs> there's like- famous and there's writer famous, meaning not famous. <laughs> but um, well, I, I've also just been thinking a lot about community and you and I uh, met at the community of writers last summer at, um, mm-hmm. at the Squaw Valley Resort. And just, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many times, I think you had mentioned you'd been twice or. Yeah, that was my second time. Oh, okay. And what, um, for those in the audience who are interested in, who are writers themselves, like what, what, uh, what is it about these communities that you've, you found helpful, like de-, de facto or, you know, formal and informal and communities you might be a part of? I've, I've only been to, oh no, actually I've been to several. I, I did bread loaf a long time ago. I was uh, like a, a waiter of bread loaf when they still had that. Oh, I was a waiter too. <laughs> yeah. Did you have to do a crazy dance? Uh, yes, our, but we had a fiddler, we have a professional musician poet, so it was, they did this fiddler on the roof routine. Oh, wow. It was amazing, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, some of my closest friends, like Reese Kwan, uh, like they're all, we all met through the waitership, so. Oh, that's so cool. That's yeah. Um, but anyway, sorry, <laughs> so you've been to various conferences over the years. Yeah, and I did a Tin House Winter one last year, which was, that was, that was really amazing. Oh, was that with Lydia, or? I was sorry. Was that with Lydia or who did you study? Who did I work with? I worked with um, uh, Ted Chang. Oh my gosh. I just uh, read his collection. Yeah. Yeah. When I knew he was going to be there, I was like, I have to like try to get myself in there. Yeah. Um, but I, I love these conferences. Um, I think like, I, I mean, I wish I could go to one every summer because you just work by your, it's so solitary working yeah. by yourself and you know I mean most of us have writers groups that we're in but still even beyond that it just is you know kind of plugging away and these conferences are so fun you're just like surrounded by people and they all want to talk about books just as much as you do yeah you know and just like I love all the readings the lectures the workshops that are always really interesting I like squad too because they rotate different people every day yeah um and I, I really like there's a kind of friendliness in about squad too that I really enjoy. There's very little hier- hierarchy. You could just sit down with, you know, with the famous writers you read, you know? Yeah. I think they're wonderful. Yeah. So yeah, this was supposed to be their 50th anniversary, but hopefully all the celebrations will be next year. So in the after times that we're all hoping for. If we're even, you know, over this by the summer. Yeah. So um, I saw that you're also, uh, you, you mentioned that you're taking some time off from the program, but you're in counseling, um, a counseling program. And how does that, do you think that's also kind of tied into your writing, like wanting to get into people's heads or is that somehow related or? Yeah, I feel like the impulse is similar. I've noticed, I've seen here and there other writers who are also um, therapists too. Yeah. And I think it just comes from the same place, like, like a, you know, kind of like a real interest in understanding people. Yeah. And um, there's, you know, kind of like finding connections. I don't know, something about my experience of growing up in an all white place. It, one of the things that did teach me was like, you can actually find it a connection with anybody. There's always something that you will have in common with this person who might look like, you know, you have nothing, you would never, your paths would never cross. Um, And that's what I like, like about being a therapist too, is that, you know, when people are kind of going through different things, you can be right there with them, you know, and it's not like, you're not telling them to do anything, but the fact that you're there with them helps them along on that journey. And it's a way for them to confront their own selves which is really hard I think for us to do in our modern culture by ourselves you know it's it's I just think there's so much noise that um and it's so there's so many ways we can distract ourselves that it's gotten harder and harder to know who we ourselves are and part of that has led to 
our what's happening politically and in our world you know i just see that there's a direct line and <clears throat> yeah there's people really struggle to turn off that noise and then there's a buildup of kind of you know just restlessness and happiness and they don't know what to do with that doom scrolling <laughs> doom scrolling um, but, you know, and it's interesting, um, what I've loved uh, when I hear from readers is sometimes I'll hear, like, your book reached me exactly at the right time in my life. Mm -hmm. I needed to read this story or feel made visible through this character. And um, so I think in that same way, literature really can also help yeah. quiet the noise and, and then also make hopefully readers feel like less alone or feel in community or at least or understand people they know um, a little better. Um, uh, oh, so I just, if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. So, um, and so uh, have you been able to write now, Carolyn, or? Yeah, I mean, I, I've i been um, able to write short pieces. I find that, you know, I've been trying to work on this novel and anything long form is really has, feels difficult because every day feels like a different world sometimes. So it's really hard to like keep up that continuity, I think. There's like different explosions you have to deal with on a certain day. So I found during this time, I'm probably writing about the same amount, but I'm writing a lot more like flash fiction and shorter stories. And they're also definitely getting weirder, I think. Um, well, reality is pretty weird. So. Right? Right. Yeah, I feel like uh, there's really, yeah, there's no certainty, so. <laughs> well, and um, I, I think motherhood was once described as like somewhere a pot is bo boiling over or about mm -hmm. to boil over. And so it just feels like all burners are about to boil over these days, you know, yeah. so it is, it can be hard to have uh, sustained concentration. Um, but yeah, I, so... So for me, I, well, I turned in my next novel to my editor, oh. but we'll, well, I mean, we'll see, like they, she has to, probably has other things, to up. but, um, but I've been, so I've been working on essays and um, I worked on, I think my first novella, it suddenly, it just kept getting longer and longer. So that's we'll, awesome. Yeah. But it's, I mean, but then it's always that trade-off. Like, I don't know if you noticed earlier, my son ran in, <laughs> <and then laughs> there is dad on the deck, like, pointing that way i don't know it just, it just always seems like totally lock the door then they'll pound on it so <laughs> you know what now i write in my bathroom really interesting how do you do how do you do you light a candle to set the mood or how do you no it's actually so I, my my bathroom um it's like from the 90s so it has one of those like this huge tubs with the jet and stuff and like, I've never taken a bath in it, but the best thing about it is it has this really like kind of thick, like edge to it. Yeah. And so it's perfect. Like I can set my computer, my laptop on there and like my books, I can just set a whole bunch of, it's like a desk for me. But do, oh, do, I mean, do you have a tray table or is it like you're, you're facing the edge? Yeah, I'm facing the edge. And then oh. they're like, there's some like couple of stairs that I can use to like put my books on and stuff. And I have this like tiny, tiny stool that I sit on. <laughs> And then, you know, it's easy for me to like, if I need to feel like, okay, I've been sitting too long, then I can stand up and just put it like on my, next to my sink. And I like just, you know, keep typing on that. But I found that when I'm in the bathroom, nobody will come bother me. Like that. <laughs> that is your, it sounds like, yeah, it's like you're inside an egg or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if my bedroom door is closed, he'll still come in. But yeah. the bathroom is like, okay, it's off limits. <laughs> so now that you've come clean with your kids, do you... Yeah think uh they are they are they ever like oh are you gonna write about me or like how or how, yeah how does how does your whole family deal with this <laughs> it's so funny how family like I feel like that's the first thing people do is like look for themselves you know um my so my kids will sometimes they'll they'll point things out they'll be like I I think I said that or something right <laughs> or they'll just ask you know, they've asked me point blank, like, are you going to write about me or something? And I'm like, I kind of do, but not, you know, like, specifically, it's more, 
yeah, something you've said or done that kind of, you know, sparks something in me? Yeah, I, I think for myself, I don't ever really take the thinly veiled approach. I won't say I'll never do that, but like, I think what it might inspire me might end up totally sideways from what the original thing was. Yeah, yeah. My husband, though, he always tries to, like, if there's a husband, he'll be like, I think he's always trying to read if that's him or not. <laughs> <laughs> like, am I a jerk? Yeah. <laughs> People will think I'm a jerk. And I'm like, no, I, it's not like that. <laughs> First of all, I, you, I mean, do you feel, I don't feel like I'm every character either, you know, so. Oh, actually, in a way, I, not that I do, but I do feel like with my characters, perhaps, the fact that I thought of, they often make very poor choices, <laughs> means that I at least like considered or thought about it. So in that way, it is reflective of me that like, it, I mean, I'm not the character, but it, all our characters came from us, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, I've noticed in your book, your characters are so diverse. Like they are, you know, they're, some of them are Korean, they're Chinese, Japanese, sometimes they're not Asian at all. Is that like something you ever like consciously thought about or these are just like, they just came to you that way? Yeah, I think, um, so in the first edition, it took me about, uh, there were 10 stories over 10 years. In this uh, latest edition, there's three additional stories. So that's like a decade and a half of my work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at the time, for much of it, I was a daily news journalist. And so in my whatever job job, I was very used to going out and um, talking to people and hearing their stories, like with, you know, backgrounds, not like mine, but, um, and so I was very used to the idea of, of wanting to write across race or gender or orientation or generation. Um, but it's, you know, <clears throat> speaking of Alex Chi, like I think um, he, he wrote a really interesting essay on like how you write across culture um, and, you know, the questions you have to ask yourself first, like, do you have any people from that community on your bookshelves or among your friends <laughs> or, you know, so before like to find out about like, oh, I want to learn all about such and such culture, you know, writing about them is maybe like the third step and not the first step, which I thought to be so useful. Like, um, yeah. you know, it's interesting. One of the stories, the last story in to see other possibilities is about this Korean missionary. And I showed it to my friend, the one who I texted uh, today with your your story, but, um, and he was Korean Christian and I'd wondered like, oh, how is he gonna react to it? And he thought the story was great, but he did have this one thing that he pointed out. He was like, the little girl, and then one of the missionaries, you say, you know, one has stocky legs and sturdy legs. And then I was like, oh, and then he point, I don't, have you heard of mudati legs? Mm -mm. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So a Korean insult is to have daikon or water radish legs, basically cables. Right. And, and, and so, um, you know, their cankleness was not something I intended to emphasize, no. but I ended up taking it out from the story because it wasn't, it was a distraction ultimately, but I was glad I had him read it because I just wouldn't think to think that this was perhaps something to be sensitive about. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. Well, I mean, in that same way, it's like, should people of color, there's a whole debate about like, should you say their delicious, their skin color is delicious foods? <laughs> but then it's like, what, are we eating POC? And then it's been pointed out that co co coffee and cocoa mm -hmm. are born out of, are products born out of the slave trade. So there's just like so much to think about um, when, when you're writing. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that just having someone to show it to is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about, like, um, the title of one of them, which is similar, like, kind of your, the book title is a, it's The Responsibility of C. Okay. And I just thought that was so interesting because I never thought of it as a responsibility. But there is something to that, like, the way that, you know, parents and children or really in the, the they'll kind of protect each other by not saying not revealing things about their own lives yeah. that was really interesting can you talk more about that sure um and uh i i actually did an interview 
the other week and someone asked the same question, they were very curious about like, well, what does that mean? But it, I think growing up in a Asian American family, like it wasn't like, well, there's the secrets where they, you know, say of war that they're just not going to go into, but then there's just sort of the language or cultural or generational gap. I mean, the love is, is there. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's through things like my mom saying like, here's all the shrimp from my soup. I know it's your favorite, so so here. Or my, you know, insisting, my dad would like, uh, the car had these like slots for coins back when you paid for <laughs> meters with coins. But anyway, he would like, he filled it with quarters. I was like a grown adult by then, but like I'd come home and he'd like, and also like stock my car with bottled water. So. But were they saying like, oh, I love you. And, you know, so that was like the responsibility to me was manifested through like the things they did. And so in that same way, it's like, well, are there some things we're just like, we're, let's not discuss these things yet. Or, you know, just feel, I mean, in some ways that can say for my characters that can create, a, you know, a pain and distance. But yet at the same time, they're sort of torn because they feel like this is something I need to do for my characters or need to do for my family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Cause you like caught the, the nuance with that. Like there's, you know, of course there's a dark side to that too. Right. Yeah. Um, and like in, I think it's in your story room at the table. I think, wait, hold on. Let me see if I can find Oh yeah, she says, yet the secrets also turned her into a, into a stranger to her family, to herself. I thought that was really well done and because there's a price to be paid, right? Yeah. Not just to her family, but to herself. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, um, I, I think that's, you know, there's that talk of like American dream or sacrifices and like what, what does that all, how does that all sort of manifest in the end? with, you know, the very children that, you know, you wanted so much for. So mm -hmm. uh, I know we're kind of coming up on the hour, but I just um, wanted to ask, like, just in terms of your stories, is there anything just in terms of like how you decided to order them or once you decided like, hey, these individual things like are a, a collection, like how you thought of it in, in putting it together and sort of arranging it or, or making a mixtape since we, we both know what mixtapes are. I remember talking to a high school class and they're like, playlist? But anyway, how did you make your play uh, mixtape? Um, yeah, God, I don't, I mean, that's still, I think, super, super hard. And I, um, I just like, I did the most basic thing really, which was to be like, here's some long stories. Oh, okay, well, I don't wanna put some shorter stories in between. I do wish, I mean, it was, because it was a contest, um, I think they just didn't want to mess with it because they were like, this is what the judge picked. And so it kind of has to stay in that way. But if I thought, if I had had my choice, like I probably would have taken out a story and maybe put in a different story. Um, but I, I definitely actually think I could have used more help in that department. But I just tried to give a sense of um, kind of the diverse nat nature of uh, the Korean diaspora, um, the viewpoints of different people and at different times. And yeah, just kind of like try to spread it out. Well, I thought, I thought it was really well done. And you definitely showed that it's not a monolith and you know, you show people and all sort of their strength and their, their uh, foibles. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it was wonderful. Is there uh, anything else just to you that that you've been thinking of or hope to to share? Or um, I'm just so I'm really grateful to Drew Hines Prize, uh, the foundation, and um, to the University of Pittsburgh Press, and to Alexander Chi. Um, oh, was he the judge? Or yeah, he was a judge. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I'm like so grateful to prize and prizes like this, and your book also won a book prize too, yeah. right? Because there, I mean, it's really hard to get short stories out, collections of short stories out in the world. So these prizes are super important, you know, and I'm really grateful. And I hope we have even more prizes for short stories. And I would love to see more of an audience for short stories. Or I feel like uh, books like yours do help open the way for someone to feel like, you know, there's, a, there's room for my story too. Oh, good. I hope so. <laughs> yeah.
So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for, for your stories and such a great conversation. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good Thanks night. everyone for coming tonight. <laughs>